last night. I didn't sleep quite as well. I was falling asleep and then I could hear somebody stomping around and actually making drumming sounds with their hands. And so I had to actually tell them to be quiet because it was 10.30 and that's when I was trying to fall asleep. So that was unfortunate, but that's just something that happens. And then it took me a while to fall asleep after that, maybe an hour. But I did fall asleep, which was good. And I woke up kind of early, so I might have slept seven or six and a half hours. It might actually be good to get one of those Fitbit things that keeps track of sleep and heart rate for my own knowledge because these are some of the things that are actually some of the most important variables especially now moving in life without the meds and today I am again feeling some of that so-called anxious feeling in my heart and body it could be my body sort of craving the lithium in the morning like where's the lithium you didn't take it last night so just wanting to move through that and I'm drinking chamomile tea and I had some hawthorn extract which is good for the heart and I'm also hoping to spend more time outside when I get this last bit of dialogue done after the 20th in nine days I want to just go down to one video a day and change the conversation slightly and yesterday I got through everything I wanted to get through and I was editing forever. I was probably working on stuff between videoing and editing and everything for eight hours. It's probably the longest I've ever done. Perhaps one of the longest. And, and after editing them, I actually came up with quite a few extrapolations and I was hoping that wouldn't happen. So I'll go through those because it's kind of more positive and after that I want to read some of this negative-ish stuff and just put it out there and get it out there and move on. And it's actually a bit of a reminder to me about why maybe I shouldn't go back and dip my toe in the system because something I see can create a lot of information around this stuff that I don't want to look at and I don't want to be a part of and and I could go back and try and be a part of it or I could just read this and maybe put it out there one day and let that do the talking and move on with my life if I'm so fortunate to continue to live it and it's also a reminder of why perhaps I can't work in peer support Maybe I can still do other things that I've been trained to do, but we'll see. We'll see. I really want to focus on thriving and altruism. So thriving myself and using my energy to help others. And also things like oxygen and laughter and singing and dancing and oxytocin. So hopefully I can move into these as I wind this part of the dialogue down leading up to the 20th, but some of these energies might have other ideas. And a friend emailed me and asked if I was concerned about these other energies coming back and will I be able to ride it out? And I was saying, well, it's funny you asked that because I've been asking myself that same thing. Will I be able to ride it out? So I think the next part might be all positive and lovely, but it might not. There might be some real energy to ride out and really surf the wave of consciousness and maybe fall off and and crash to the bottom and have to climb my way up again somehow and i was thinking about how some of my older writing from two years ago that i haven't looked at i feel like it was from a higher state of consciousness it was more instruction to myself or writing as another entity perhaps and i feel like the self-dialogue has a lot of old mixed in with the new or or creating context of past experience and I wonder if one day there will be a connection with just that that other voice that isn't about something that isn't about the past but is speaking almost from another dimension and I don't know if that's true but that's part of why I want to end this mental health conversation and just 
connect with that other voice and not talk about mental health, but just move with the process that initially was, that got translated into a mental health condition, but it's more like mental health conditioning. I was conditioned to feel like it's all mental health illness and stuff. And I realized this next bit actually could be talking myself out of the me. So I talk myself out of the mental health system, but now I'm left with me and I need to talk myself out of that because the me could actually lead to destructive patterns, perhaps. So can I keep talking to myself to keep myself ahead of that me? Can I talk to myself about the altruistic projects I wanna start and things like that, which are, are selfless and, and use that to move away from this me, this self that might wish to destroy this body? And I was thinking about how I shared that, that guy from the colon hydrotherapy clinic said, write stuff down and look at it. Like there was some kind of witnessing element there that was helpful. And I realized that this self dialogue, talking to myself on video is the same. It's an equivalent process to writing stuff down and looking at it. I do write stuff down and look at, look at it and then I talk about it. And then I look at that and then I just leave it alone and move on. And I was thinking about how perceptual insight is like fusion. It creates more energy and information than it takes in or that takes to initiate that process. And in that way, it's immeasurable because if we take any kind of measuring instrument, it's measuring something out of the whole. So a ruler measures something out of the whole, but how do you create an instrument that can measure that which is beyond the initial input in a way? And I'm sure you can, but a ruler takes a bit out of the whole, but what if something creates more? So what are those variables? Where do they come from? So I can't remember if I mentioned that the heart coherence I did yesterday, the breathing coherence, wasn't as easy. It wasn't as easy to stay in coherence as it had been. And also, when I was editing all those videos yesterday, I took 16,000 steps, according to my iPhone, and I usually don't take that many steps, probably like three to 5,000. Which isn't enough for sure, but it was a cool enough day to be able to edit outside. And in terms of the dream center, I actually have this feeling that it actually will save my life in my next life. And of course I can't prove whether that's true, but what if it's possible that what we create in this life is actually what will help us in the next life or hinder us? And I talked about how a mental health diagnosis is really a consolidation of, of the past and trauma. And Medication is a consolation prize, and so is recovery a lot of times, and the life we get to live because of that. And I was thinking about the abstractions and context I've made for myself, and they could be a safety net for looking at old energies that might arise that need processing. So the four episodes I've had of psychosis over the last three years while taking medications they were sort of a pattern that I could get used to. And so now that I'm off meds, it could be something completely different. It might look completely different. So will the context that I've created prepare me for that and help save me through that? And it's difficult to process the old while being in touch with so much more new information, the old mixed with the new. And can I get through that old mixed with the new time and just live in the new. And this mixture state seems to be when map perception is still self-reflexive. 
and that makes me think that this process is impersonal. So that could be part of talking me out of the me, is that any energies that come through for processing aren't personal, even if they arise as personal experiences in the past, because that's how the me would interpret these energies, is it's something from the past when it could just be a bunch of energy coming through and it gets translated into the me voice because that's the language we speak inside. But to be with those energies without the words of the me, without self-reflexive action on these energies, just letting them move through and not translating them according to the me. And that could be a key. To be dispassionate and 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 feel like it has nothing to do with me. Because we have in our orientation inside to feel like everything has everything to do with us all the time, according to how we think it does. So can I surrender that? Can I release that? And I was thinking about when I was first in map consciousness before I was labeled and how I was losing a lot of weight. And I was thinking about how mitochondria can burn ketones, which is from fat for energy. So I was thinking about if I was in a state that required a lot of energy, all of a sudden my my body was using the fat stores for energy and the mitochondria were able to use that for fuel. And it could have been because I was staying awake a lot, but it could also just be that high energy state, that energy had to come from somewhere. And the state of burning ketones actually helps to repair and recycle old mitochondria. So the weak ones die off and new ones come about. So I can just see a correlation with what my body was doing and just this high state of energy. So it seems like I was going into this higher state of energy. I need more and better and stronger mitochondria. So I was in ketosis, even though I wasn't just eating fat. And and that process was actually changing the cellular energetics of my body. And maybe had I been able to continue through that, I would have actually have been stronger. And I remember in that process, feeling very strong, like I was able to balance more and I was more fluid and I was I was just way stronger and I was lean and quite powerful. So there was something changing in my body. that was a change that the universe initiated it wasn't oh because I was eating a certain way or doing something consciously to do that and the fact that we can put ourselves into ketosis by say eating a high fat low protein low carb diet that's one thing but the fact that we have that metabolic ability could actually have something more to do with the universe and and initiating that process for some reason to make the body more able to produce energy, which it seems like it was doing because I needed energy because I was in a higher energy state. So I can see that there could be some value into me actually volitionally doing this because that's what the universe was trying to do.
So this is actually in alignment with harvesting my mania, not just harvesting it intellectually or spiritually or, or psychologically or philosophically, but also physiologically. And it seems like my body went into ketosis and it was trying to upgrade the mitochondrial functioning to be able to burn more oxygen. And this ability to burn more oxygen could actually be important for higher states of consciousness. So I will probably do those sprints every two or three days. It's not much of anything and I don't really exercise. So it's more about embodying one's mania. So one can exercise to burn fat or have a better body, but I feel like I want to in order to embody my mania and get with the process that it seems like the universe was initiating and being able to process more oxygen. And this could be part of the mutation that happens in the transformation. It's not just a mutation in the mind, but it's also a mutation in the physiological functioning of the body. And it's interesting that the medications we take actually mess up the physiological functioning of our body. So often we gain weight and, and are less able to move about and be active. So it goes a little bit back to that superhumanness and do I have to be somewhat superhuman to survive this transformation or will the transformation create me as a bit of a superhuman? And I kind of want to see that movie Wonder Woman for a little bit of inspiration. We have to be able to create and process a lot of energy. And I wonder if there's something to do with perception and the mitochondria. So by moving in perception and action, and how that creates more information and energy to act upon and move, that has some kind of mitochondrial implication. So we as people who go into map consciousness, or so-called bipolar people, we go into these really high energy states and we're super perceptive and, and have this hyper ability to perceive. And that could have something to do with the energy. That might actually create some of the energy that we have to process. So we need mitochondria in order to be able to harvest those electrons. Maybe there's electrons and energy from a different source, from perceiving light and, and translating that in all the ways that I've talked about with myself. So everything I've talked about with myself, but just add in the little mitochondria to the equation in terms of one of the physiological factors. So all in all, doing some sprints could actually be one of the most important things for embodying one's mania. Inviting that energy back, being able to process that energy, have some capacitance for that energy, transform it, amplify it, and really create with it. Instead of being creative with it and then ending up falling into the mental health system. If we never fell out of that high state of energy, whatever you want to call it, it's called mania in a more pathological connotation in that the aftermath of that is bad, but what if there was no aftermath? So the medications could actually block some kind of mitochondrial energetic processes. And even this so-called anxiety I'm feeling could have something to do with the mitochondria, changing their energetics, and it's slightly uncomfortable to the body, just like having your tooth pulled or something, but it's something that needs to be done. We cannot hold meaning in our hand but we can apprehend it and it moves us. And in that way, it's part of the manifest. And I feel like the other dimension has a different field of gravity and our mass is lighter, or it's just that we are aligned in gravity. When our physiology is in alignment with gravity, we feel lighter. So the subjective experience of gravity is different. So perhaps only our personal subjectivity makes us different, our unique center of gravity. And I feel like when we're in that non-linear consciousness, we have access to the past more readily because it's a non-linear state. Plus, we're able to access information faster, so that's how our consciousness can really travel forward or backwards so quickly. And getting used to that shift and that flux and surrendering to it. My 
might be really important, but again, who's going to surrender? It's more about attending to attention and attending to the witness. And maybe we can only stay ahead of this past by creating. If the brain is being utilized for this creative capacity that it's meant and designed for, then maybe it doesn't go back to this sort of habitual state of accessing the past, which could actually just be a provocation to get more creative. So if we're not being creative in creating, the brain just recreates the past by recalling things. And one of my favorite books that I ever read was The Politics of Experience. And I think it's by R.D. Lang. And it's quite genius, everything in that book. And I think part of this is actually creating one's own experience politics. Creating one's own context is like creating one's own inner politics and and governance and writing the laws and rules of the inner dimension, which is actually a lot different than the ones that we usually experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Those are conditioned into us, but we can experience things differently, which is part of the deconditioning, but then actually understand some of these other inner politics that are more real and natural, which can actually be quite uncomfortable in the transition, and they could also change day by day. So part of it is being able to see new applications of it and, and change and be very fluid.